Hello, this is Yuri Litor Optsov, and you're listening to Image is Psyche, a podcast dedicated to our fantasy lives. On today's program, we're going to Bollingen. It's a place where Carl Gustav Jung built his tower. Since last fall, I'm a student at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich. The institute was created in 1948. This is the place where they train Jungian analysts. But it's also a place of reflection and exploration and self-development for, for people you know, who are very curious and, and interested in analytical psychology. So, for instance, certain lectures are open to the public you just pay your ticket at the door and you, you know, you attend the lecture with all the students of the institute sitting next to you. So for the past 16 years, I considered myself um, one of those curious people because I was really interested by Jung's work. But curious is great, but it's not enough to cross the threshold of the institute and enroll into a training program you've got to have a project and i was hesitating and because you know first of all the training is happening in kusnach so it's in switzerland it's not so close to paris and um you know the question of financial cost you know had to be um taken into account but then also i was thinking about um my own personal project why why would i do that i'm already an artist and a professional coach why this in training would be uh, important to me and it's funny because if you open the code of ethics uh, of the jung institute in the very beginning you find this wonderful uh, extraordinary phrase which says that as an institution dedicated to depth psychology cg jung institute is interested in the dialogue with the unconscious that means that from the very very beginning then conscious is on the table and uh you can have a whatever project you want the question is what does the unconscious say about that i received the answer to this question um in a dream uh, right before I uh, enrolled, or actually I sent out the, the application to the Institute. So in this dream, I am standing in front of like very uh, big uh, gates that are open. Uh, and behind those gates, I see some sort of medieval, kind of like a hamlet. So I'm looking through the, the gates and I see a, a white uh, building with a red uh, roof. And the facade of this building is decorated by this very curious circular, very flowery kind of uh, decorations. Um, The building looks very much like the Jung Institute, which I have seen from the street a couple of months before. Uh, So I made a drawing of my dream. I analyzed it and I I made my decision to actually to send out my, my application. But I never really understood the the meaning behind this decor, this strange decor on the facade of the building in the dream. The mystery was sort of resolved uh, a couple of months later when I was accepted and I started classes at the Jung Jung Institute. And it turns out that the ground floor uh, conference room at the Institute is called Sala Terena. And it is decorated in a circular floral uh, motif that is identical to the one that I've seen in my dream. But how is it possible? I never put a foot, you know, inside the institute before that. So, yeah, my journey started like that, with a synchronicity. And uh, journey, I think, is a good word to describe it because... It's a long process and it's not an easy one. So I'm just in the beginning of it. and uh, But I'm happy because this is something that puts you in contact with something very important and deep. So I just finished my first semester at the Institute. 
like 220 hours of uh, classes, fantastic lectures uh, on dream analysis, image analysis, but also more generally on, you know, psychopathology and analytical work. So I'm a happy student. Ballingen is a village located um, in 40 kilometers away from Zurich and it's there that Jung has decided to build what is now called his tower at Ballingen. I have seen the aerial images of Ballingen around 1919 and I must tell it's not the same uh, place as it is now. At the time it was a bit wilder, it has more uh, trees and more isolated. The Jung's family, um, they made excursions on a boat to Bollingen and this is how they uh, discovered this this wonderful place. So uh, this part of the of the lake, it has much less navigation and in comparison to what's happening around Zurich. So it's a very quiet place. Jung had a chance to buy the land in 1922. At the time, sort of the principal access was by by the lake. And as for us, we took a minivan. The The trip to Bollingen was organized by the Jung Institute. And uh, I must say that the, the tower uh, at Ballingen is not uh, available for visits, it's not accessible to general public. This is a place that still belongs to the family and uh, it's a private property and the family uh, opens the doors to just very s- carefully selected groups you know, of specialists or students like us who, who have this privilege to, uh, to visit uh, for free this place. And uh, so we were like 20 people. We arrived uh, at Ballingen and, you know, we had to walk a little bit before we arrived at the tower, which is located on the on the lake's edge. So uh, the tower uh, appeared to us uh, progressively from afar. First, we saw the contour of the, uh, the roof, which looks very much like a miniature uh, medieval castle. And then uh, while you approach closer, you see the, uh, the enclosure, you see the walls and then uh, the, the wooden door. So the tower does have an appearance of a small fortress. I must say that for people like me and my colleagues who are really interested by Jung's work, to be able to visit the tower at Ballingen, it's a really special moment. We all saw the images of the tower, the photographs, but to be invited there and to be able to visit this uh, place, it's really something special. So you feel that something special, you know, when you approach the tower. At the entrance, we're greeted by this man whose name is Gordon Fisher is one of the uh, great grandsons of Jung and he will be our host and he will guide us through what for him is the lake house of his great grandparents. This part of Lake Zurich is called Oberzee, or the Upper Lake. And lake is an important element in understanding the symbolism of the tower at Ballingen. The lake has an extraordinary presence, and uh, for me, I think it has the uh, archetypal characteristics, really. Of course, we read many times that for Jung, uh, water was an important element, but this lake is not just a, you know, flack of water. 
what comes to mind is a line from Old Man River, this song about the Mississippi River. And it says that the river knows something but doesn't say anything. So the lake uh, has this powerful magnetism. And by the way, before getting into the, you know, in, into the tower, we all sort of rushed uh, to the lake to touch it, to look at it, to really to admire. And it was the month of February, so it's not a very hot, you know, to be in contact with water. Another thing, uh, arriving at the lake, what really sort of jumped on me is the uh, the smell. It's a natural smell of lake smell, you know, all over the place and. Uh, this is something that I I know. I grew up uh, in a forest uh, with so many lakes, uh, smaller ones, all around. So I know this very characteristic um, kind of odor. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, you know, fishing. You know, I would catch this little fish and then we would fry them and they would all have this, you know, even even fish would have this taste of the lake. So that was a reminder of uh, of a time that I would spend on the shores of my lakes, you know, in my childhood. And it was uh, associated always with some sort of calmness and stillness, you know, of the nature. And you find that in Bollingen too. So the tower and the lake, they exist like in symbiosis, you know. There's a small pier that allows for boats to... To arrive uh, there's no running water at the tower no electricity either so the tower has a very minimum kind of uh, impact on the environment of the lake the tower occupies the liminal space between the deep water and the firm ground and the elements you can really see them at Bollingen well first of all the noise of uh, waves of the of the lake then the uh, you know the reeds that, that got dry and you can hear them sort of uh, whispering and uh, on the horizon you see a beautiful view of uh, snow covered mountains and all of this we saw on in the afternoon in february with a blinding sun and a limitless blue sky so this is the environment where Jung built his tower. What is important to understand that um, the tower at Ballingen was built in a completely different way. If we look at other projects where Jung uh, actively participated, for instance, his house in Kusnacht, um, it was built by an architect with an active participation of Jung. But there was a plan from the very beginning. The tower at Ballingen was built differently. There was no predefined plan in the beginning it was just some sort of intuition a sensation an idea we can say that it's actually the tower that built or realized itself over time because each uh, successive uh, addition to the tower corresponded to important stages in Jung's life Certain specialists they draw even parallels between the construction of the tower at Ballingen and Jung's work on the Red Book. It's a very complex uh, subject, so I would like just to mention two things in this regard. In the Red Book, Jung talks about the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths. So these are two uh, opposing forces. The spirit of the times would be the utility, the value, something contemporary, right now, something uh, that is alive. The spirit of the depth is different. It has no time. 
it's immortal. It contradicts the spirit of the times because it sees the, the soul as a different substance, as something uh, on its own, not something that is dependent on a mortal existence of a human being. And what's important is the balance between the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depth. Not one is stronger than the other, but in human life, one and the other are equally important. And if we look at uh, what was going on in Bollingen for Jung, this is where uh, the spirit of the depth actually lived and acted. As I mentioned before, the spirit of the depth has no time. But it's interesting if we look at the uh, appearance of the tower at Bollingen, it has a very medieval kind of look. It reminds us of a medieval castle. But one can say that this is a place that is outside of time. Jung's other great-grandson, uh, Daniel Bauman, who is an architect, he called it a space of synchronicity. There are five stages in the construction process of the tower. The first one began in 1923, and uh, in Jung's biography, uh, Memories, Dreams, Dreams, Reflections, there's a whole chapter, chapter number eight, that is dedicated to the tower. And he, there he says, Words and paper, however, did not seem real enough to me. Something more was needed. I had to achieve a kind of representation in stone of my innermost thoughts and of the knowledge I had acquired. Or, to put it another way, I had to make a confession of faith in stone. That was the beginning of the tower. So this first element that Jung constructed in 1923, it corresponded to his idea of what he wanted to do. He used an African hut as inspiration, where it would be a circular house with a fire in the center, and the, where the life of a family would be uh, revolving around. But it's interesting how the ideas we might have in our head, they, they, they change when we start the actual building process. So Jung modified his uh, initial plans, and the fire is no longer in the center. It's on the side. In the center, there's a, there's a beautiful table with four chairs all around it. Even though there are windows um, in this room, they're very narrow. So... It's slightly dark inside. This is a place that has traces of uh, past life, but at the same time, we see objects and utensils that are actually contemporary because the family is using this house as their summer house, and uh, you can see definitely the objects of this time. To the right of the entrance, uh, we can see the very steep steps of a stone uh, staircase leading on the first floor. This is where there is a, a space. Well, we were not able to access that space, but you can see that it can be a very uh, dangerous climb. In 1927, Jung starts having an impression that in its present form, the tower does not express everything what he has to say. So he decided to build an extension and adds a number of spaces. In 1931, he continues uh, the process of extension and he adds uh, another tower and uh, a number of other things, including um, a confidential, a private space for himself, which is closed, where he says, I live there for myself. Again, four years later, and it's interesting, you know, each uh, new dimension till now comes every four years. So Jung decides in 35, 1935 to add a court and a loggia that is facing the lake. It's a very kind of convivial space, you know, uh, where people can gather, there are tables, there are like uh, chairs, and there's also um, a fireplace. And you realize that uh, a house that doesn't have a central heating needs fire everywhere where it can and we, we we're thrown back to the you know to the old times where the function of fire and wood and making fire was 
principally to create warmth. So the urban dwellers that we are, we might have forgotten what it is to actually, on a daily basis, to to create that warmth, to serve the fire in the house in every corner where you can, you know, uh, refuge yourself against the, the cold, the wind, and uh, the night. For the next 20 years, uh, the tower will stay unchanged. There will be no more extensions, but Jung will continue working on embellishments. You know, he will paint the walls. He will change a little bit the, uh, the lakeside. And he will be creating a lot of works by sculpting the stone. In 1955, Jung's wife Emma dies. Jung writes, I felt an inner obligation to become what I myself am. To put it in the language of the Bollingen house, I suddenly realized that the small central section, which crouched so low, so hidden, was myself. I could no longer hide myself behind the maternal and the spiritual towers. So, in that same year, I added an upper story to this section, which represents myself or my ego personality. Earlier, I would not have been able to do this. I would have regarded it as presumptuous self-emphasis. Now, it signified an extension of consciousness achieved in old age. With that, the building was complete. I had started my first tower in 1923, two months after the death of my mother. These two dates are meaningful because the tower, as we shall see, is connected with the dead. So this is the state in which we found the tower when we finally arrived at its doorsteps. But we had to wait a little bit because we were 20. That's a too large of a group for one single visit. So they split us in two groups, those who spoke English and those who spoke uh, German. I was a part of an English-speaking group, so we had to wait for our turn. And the wait was about 45 minutes, which is uh, the duration of an analytical hour, before we actually were able to put our foot in the tower. What is curious is how each of us in the English-speaking group uh, decided to spend that time waiting for our turn. It was a beautiful day, so we kind of spread and uh, some went back to, to, to the lake. You know, the other one just sat down on the little pier. You know, one colleague even took off her shoes and went uh, into the cold waters of the lake. So it was a very meditative and personal and very kind of um, self-reflecting mo moment. Sure. Uh, we all sort of try to connect with the space, with the place, sure. with nature, and with ourselves. And uh, our group of people coming from four corners of the world, you know, probably were thinking about their own reason personal reasons to be there in that very special place. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung's biography, he writes, At times I feel as if I'm spread out over the landscape and inside things, and am myself living in every tree, in the splashing of the waves, in the clouds, and the animals that come and go, in the procession of the seasons. There is nothing in the tower that has not grown into its own form over the decades, nothing with which I am not linked. Here everything has its history and mine. Here is space for the spaceless kingdom of the worlds and the psyche's hitherland. <laughs> So now it was our time to visit the tower. And once you cross the door, what struck me first is the how crafty or 
artisanal it looked, you know. You could feel the hand of Jung, you know, that uh, he, it was a man-made, you know, it was not professionally sort of uh, perfectly executed uh, a space. You could see that was, uh, uh, that was done with, you know, with consideration to the stone, with a lot of reflection, but it's not an automated kind of uh, automatic uh, execution of things. It had a uh, human character engraved in all of this. Probably the first um, object that uh, I noticed was uh, to the left uh, from the entrance door. It's a memorial that Jung uh, sculpted, uh, dedicated to his late wife, Emma. So he did it in 1956. And uh, there's an inscription uh, in Latin dedicated to her, where he calls her a vessel of devotion and obedience. We see that Balingen is the realm of, of, of the stone, and uh, Jung says that for him, paper is no longer uh, enough. It doesn't provide enough reality. So he now he wants to work with stone. And Bollingen is going to provide that material because Bollingen is known for the quality of its uh, limestone. You know, in Zurich, uh, there are at least two uh, big churches that are built uh, use, using uh, Bollingen stone. And the stone is, of course, a three-dimensional material. And Sonu Shamdasani, uh, him who made the, the link between uh, Jung's work and Bollingen and uh, the Red Book, he proposes the possibility to consider the tower as three-dimensional active imagination. So Bollingen is an important place for creativity, for Jung's creativity. This is where it flows naturally. It takes different uh, forms and, and, and shapes. You know, throughout the tower, you can find different sculpted uh, stones, objects, painted, uh, painted ceilings, the coat of arms. These objects and the process that allowed uh, for these objects to appear in their material form uh, they are really uh, related to the spirit of the depth because uh, Bollingen for Jung is a place where the spirit of the depth lives and works. It's a counterbalance, you know, with everything what happens in Zurich, in Kusnacht. This is where the spirit of the times is operating. In 1950, another stone uh, will make its appearance uh, at the doors of the tower in, at Ballingen. The stone, however, was delivered by mistake. Jung was working on a fence at the time and ordered a bunch of stones from the quarries uh, nearby in Ballingen. And the stone arrived and uh, it couldn't be used because all the measurements were wrong. It was a perfect cube. But Jung looked at it and finally decided to keep the stone for other purposes. He called it an, an orphan stone. Uh, and this stone will become an emblem, a symbol of, uh, of the tower at Ballingen. Because Jung would take time and um, sculpt the stone. Uh, he used three sides of the stone. Uh, well, first of all, he placed it under a tree outside of the enclosure between uh, the tower and the uh, small pier in the lake, under the tree, a beautiful tree. And then later he sculpted three sides of the, of the stone with inscriptions in Latin and in Greek. One of the reasons Jung decided to put the stone outside of the tower is that he felt uh, the cube, the stone, contained uh, information and was the key to understanding the symbolism of the tower uh, in its entirety. So that's why it was like a, a manual standing outside for anybody who wanted to know to read. Well, it's not so easy because it's very cryptic. And uh, there's a wonderful uh, video of on YouTube you can find. It's a, it's a rare one. Jung... Uh, 
explaining uh, on the camera the meaning of, of what he chiseled into the stone. And Jung starts his presentation by saying, it's very cryptic. And very cryptic it is indeed. So to be able to unlock uh, the meaning of it, if, if it's possible at all, you know, first you need to speak uh, Latin and, uh, and Greek, and then, of course, uh, the metaphorical and or alchemical meaning of the inscription is also hidden within the verses that you can probably decode. On one side of the stone uh, that Jung chiseled, he placed uh, a verse from Villanova, who was an alchemist, a uh, medieval alchemist. And it says, Here stands the mean, uncomely stone. Tis very cheap in price. The more it is despised by fools, the more loved by the wise. As for the inscription in Greek, it goes like this. Time is a child, playing like a child, playing a board game, the kingdom of the child. This is Telesphorus, who roams through the dark regions of this cosmos and glows like a star out of the depths. He points the way to the gates of the sun and to the land of dreams. The third face of the stone that Jung chiseled, the one that is facing the lake, it also has a Latin inscription and it goes like this. I am an orphan, alone. Nevertheless, I am found everywhere. I am one, but opposed to myself. I am youth and old man at the same time. I have known neither father nor mother because I have had to be fetched out of the deep like a fish or fell like a white stone from heaven. In woods and mountains I roam, but I am hidden in the innermost soul of man. I am mortal for everyone, yet I am not touched by the cycle of aeons. So now we know what the stone reads, what these three inscriptions are. But do we know what it means? There's been a lot written about that, and uh, there might be many ways to, to try to uh, interpret, to understand the meaning of it. There are references, of course, to healing, because uh, Telesphorus, he's the assistant of Asclepius. There's also a reference to the, uh, to the opposites. I am one, but opposed to myself. I am youth and the old man. In some way, it's about the balance between the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depth that we need uh, in equal measure. This is the place at the tower where I spend most of my time, under that tree next to the stone. It's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic sight, you know. When you turn um, facing the tower, of course, you know, there's the tower next to you. Then there is the lake, which is an amazing presence. And then in the, in the, in the backdrop, you see those uh, mountain uh, snow-covered peaks. And then, you know, the sea, you see the water. It was very sunny. The tree is itself is very uh, picturesque. So that stone does not exist like, uh, you know, just on itself. It, it's a part of an environment. In my imagination, that I was in Rivendell. I took a lot of photographs of that site. It's really fantastic. And uh, we couldn't take any pictures inside the tower for privacy reasons, but we could definitely... Um, photograph anything uh, outside the exterior what i felt uh, being there under the tree next to the orphan stone sculpted chiseled by jung i felt first of all this kind of serenity and the natural harmony that exists all around it and it was good to be in the presence of that energy but i also felt creativity in the air that silence was pregnant with ideas. And I'm thinking about the uh, current research uh, 
that a lot of neuroscientists uh, given to us saying that to be creative, we need to be bored. We need to be silent. We need to uh, find a place where nothing happens, where the, where the natural capacity for the psyche to create is awakened. There are so many sites, uh, little objects and things to see in Bollingen. It would need um, an extra uh, program just to list them all. But if you're interested, you know, there's a bunch of books that you could uh, check out, which make an inventory of them. I particularly like the uh, 2018 book that was published by Norton uh, called The Art of C.G. Jung. The other book is in French. It's called Le Musée Imaginaire de Carl Gustav Jung uh, by Christian Gaillard. It was published by Stock in 1998. So Jung's Tower at Bollingen is an important place of creativity, but it's also an important place of incarnation, embodiment. He would say that the tower gave him an impression that he was reborn in stone. It was a concretization of his process of individuation, a symbol of psychic totality. In 1955-56, he chiseled the names of his paternal ancestors on three stone tablets and put them in the courtyard of the tower. In Memories, Dreams, Reflections, this is what he's writing about the process. When I was working on the stone tablets, I became aware of the fateful links between me and my ancestors. I feel very strongly that I am under the influence of things questions which were left incomplete and unanswered by my parents and grandparents and more distant ancestors. It often seems as if there were an impersonal karma within a family which is passed on from parents to children. It has always seemed to me that I had to answer questions which fate had posed to my forefathers and which had not yet been answered, or as if I had to complete, or perhaps continue, things which previous ages had left unfinished. Jung says that the tower is linked to the dead, to his dead, of course. But this reflection about transgenerational transmission of values, but at the same time of maybe unresolved issues, traumas, is also important to acknowledge. And this brings him to another more collective reflection on us as a civilization and on the challenges that our civilization is facing in relationship to this. This is what he writes. We are very far from having finished completely with the Middle Ages classical antiquity and primitivity, as our modern psyches pretend. It is precisely the loss of connection with the past, our uprootedness, which has given rise to the discontents of civilization and to such a flurry and haste that we live more in the future and its chimerical promises of a golden age than in the present with which our whole evolutionary background has not yet caught up. We refuse to recognize that everything better is purchased at the price of something worse, that, for example, the hope of greater freedom is cancelled out by increased enslavement to the state, not to speak of the terrible perils to which the most brilliant discoveries of science expose us. The less we understand of what our fathers and forefathers sought, the less we understand ourselves. And thus, we help with all our might to rob the individual of his roots and his guiding instincts, so that he becomes a particle in the mass, ruled only by what Nietzsche called the spirit of gravity. This is pretty serious stuff, so we see that Bollingen is not a summer country house for Jung. It's a place where 
deep reflection surfaces in his imagination and where he writes he would spend up to six months of his year in Bollingen. So Bollingen is a place of creation, reflections and facing this kind of uh, serious and dark uh, ideas about his own uh, psychic life and the collective psyche of humanity. Jung's tower at Ballingen fascinated a lot of people. So we have uh, accounts of various uh, celebrities or artists actually visiting the tower at Ballingen. In the 70s, it's Federico Fellini, the Italian uh, filmmaker, who, uh, in his correspondence with George Simenon, mentions uh, his visit uh, of the tower. This is what he writes. This tower looks like a kind of a small shack built on the edge of the lake. It's gigantic. Yet it looks like the work of a child, an object modeled in clay by hand. I felt great respect because it looks like a poor nativity scene, but also a bit like a small theater. The whole thing suits me perfectly because not only does it try to reproduce something from antiquity, from the Middle Ages, but it really has something theatrical about it. We went up a small narrow staircase carved into the stone and opened a small door. At first, it was pitch black. Then I saw a tiny stuffy room with two small gothic windows with thick glass panes, with the walls painted by Jung himself, the mandalas and a study of different myths, then small objects. I had the impression of feeling a more human, greater, closer and more mysterious Jung. What made him bigger in my eyes was the infinite humility with which he had submitted to repeating old rituals which do not need a pompous staging. It was the poverty of the Bantu sorcerer. If a scientist like him, a philosopher, a thinker, accepts the conditioning and the limits of a ritual that to our eyes at least may seem vaguely ridiculous, it means that he knows how to see deeper and that he has really left behind all those things that generally pass for the proper behavior. I can certainly relate to Fellini's uh, comments after the visit of the tower at Ballingen. During our visit, Mr. Fisher showed us uh, a photograph of Jung and his wife Emma sitting, uh, eating dinner in the main tower. It's very dark. We see a bottle of wine on the table. It's very modest. So one might think Jung, who at the time was already a famous psychiatrist with clients coming from all over the world seeking his help. Emma, one of the biggest fortunes in Switzerland at the time. The two are having very modest dinner in a place that has no electricity and no running water. So it could potentially uh, look ridiculous, but it's not. There's something incredibly humble and authentic about the tower. Our visit was over. We thank our host and guide, Mr. Fisher. The tower hasn't opened all doors to us. There's still a lot of mystery remains. And I think I like it that way. Thank you so much for listening.